Good evening, everyone. We will get started in just a few minutes. We'll just give it about two minutes to allow everyone to enter the room, and then we will get started. All right, everyone, so we will get started. Um, welcome, my name is Lloyd Lesperance. I'm the chief of staff here at the Freelancers Union, and I would like to welcome you all to this wonderful event. Um, the focus of this event is about issues facing freelancers in the fashion industry. Um, as many of you may know, there are a prevalence of issues that face freelancers, whether it's in fashion or other industries, but particularly in the fashion industry, they have um, acute in particular issues that haven't been addressed yet or even brought up to light. You know, whether that's wage payment, uh, wage theft or non-payment to struggles of starting a small business to financial transparency, to even an extent of like sexual abuse or discrimination, other types of abuse. Um, but, you know, part of this is to have a conversation and to talk about these issues and to make people more aware about these issues, but then also for us to build community and and grow our community and be able to one day hopefully address these issues and come up with solutions. And we can only come up with solutions when we work together. Um, with that, I would like to introduce our panelists. We have a nice distinguished guest here and I will start one by one to introduce each and we will get started once after that. So let's begin with Brendan McGearney. Hi everyone. So <clears throat> I'm a photographer and a digital tech. Uh, I currently work as a freelancer. I moved to New York about eight years ago and got my first job at Pier 59 working in the equipment room. I worked as a, you know, a full-time employee for another four years. And then four years ago, I started working as a freelancer. And, you know, I've had the opportunity to work for all different sizes and types of companies. And in the last couple of years, I've been trying to leverage this freelance work uh, to make space in my life for more personal photography. And, you know, it's an honor to be speaking on this panel with so many distinguished people. Great. Thanks, Brendan. Um, next, we will go to Misha Brooks. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Misha Brooks, and I serve on the Leadership Council of the Model Alliance. I am also a proud member of sag After, so the Screen Actors Guild as an actress. Um, so that's yay, uh, a union. <laughs> I am a <laughs> model <laughs> and an entrepreneur as well. And at the Model Alliance, we are a labor advocacy organization for people who work in the fashion industry. So as close as to a union as we can have. Uh, so for the last decade, we've actually been working to create safe, fair, and equitable working conditions in the industry for everyone. Um, and that's not just models, even though our name is Model Alliance. So we really are working to unite all of us in the fashion industry and create uh, change. Thank you. Great. Um, and now I'd like to introduce Kira Long and Demi Fiku. Hi everyone, I'm Demi. I'm a fashion journalist. I've been investigative, uh, investigating the fashion industry since uh, the Me Too movement started in 2017 and spoke with a lot of survivors, mostly models, but now we're starting to work with other people in the fashion industry. And um, I was really happy to bring Care on board last year. And we got initial funding from the Brown Institute of Media Innovation at Columbia Journalism School, our alma mater. And so 
we've just been working on this really interesting and um, intense <laughs> investigative fashion journalism project with Kara. And um, it's the first project that we know that is doing something like we're doing. Um, and we'll tell you all more about it when we speak about it. But we're pretty much tracking sexual assault in fashion cases and um, tracking that data in multiple ways. So yes, and I'll let Kara introduce herself now too. Hi, it's wonderful to be here. Um, I'm really happy to be sharing a virtual stage with so many really distinguished people um, who contribute so much to the field. Um, as Demi said, uh, I'm also a journalist. I specialize in investigative work and audio producing. So uh, I really, really was thrilled to be brought on board to work on this project with Demi and to um, to learn from her because she, she really uh, she's done some very intense reporting on the subject already for several years, um, and it's really great to be a part of finally documenting that. Great. Well, thank you both for joining us. And finally, I would like to introduce our last uh, panelist, Tristan, uh, who's been working on special specific policy for freelancers. Hey, everyone. I'm Tristan. Um, I've been working in the video field uh, for the last 15 or so years in post-production um, with a focus on fashion and beauty brands and products. Um, recently, I've been working with Lloyd and uh, the Fashion Workers Alliance, uh, Initiative uh, to develop a policy to get freelancers paid uh, on a net seven schedule, uh, which I'll talk more about uh, during my segment. Thank you. Great, thanks for joining us. So let's jump right in and we're gonna start off with Brendan. Um, just give me one second here. <coughs> We'll keep them all up. Uh, so, Brendan, <laughs> uh, so tell us a little bit about your business and what got you started in, to be a freelancer. Yeah, so, um, you know, I was very passionate about photography when I first moved to New York, and, but I'd never worked in fashion or commercial photography. And a friend of mine, he uh, was working at Pier 59 in the equipment room, and, he's a, and I needed a job, and so I was like, okay, that sounds great. And that kind of got me started in the industry. So uh, even though it was kind of by chance that I arrived here, I'm incredibly grateful for my experience working in fashion and all types of commercial photography. In my time here in New York City, I've learned an incredible amount, like an incredible amount of technical skills, mm -hmm. um, which I never would have imagined learning all thanks to fashion photography. And, you know, so I worked in at this big studio, then I moved to a, a smaller retouching studio. I also worked in a, you know, like kind of a medium sized clothing uh, company. Mm -hmm. Then um, after that, I, you know, I, I was very grateful for all the opportunities I'd been given, but I just wasn't a great fit for full time work. I'm kind of, uh, fiercely independent, I guess I could say, <laughs> you know, going to an office every day, uh, being managed by people. Um, it wasn't a good environment for me. So I started to make the change to freelance work. And, you know, of course that also has its, um, its difficulties, but, um, you know, in the last, the last four years, I've been really happy kind of taking some, taking more control in terms of my career and the, the specific types of work I do. And, you know, it's really been a, a great, a great four years. So what has been like one of the most difficult obstacles for you to overcome, like getting started as a small business? So I'm, the obstacles are twofold. First of all, I think the getting, you know, being a small business, you have to advocate for yourself. And there's a lot of things that you don't realize when you first become a freelancer, or at least I didn't personally realize that, you know, the company is taking care of for me while I was employed for them, uh, whatever company that might have been. The, you know, paying taxes, getting your health insurance, and then just the most basic, like finding work and making sure that you're well prepared and you have all the skills and equipment necessary to complete that job and finally getting paid, which is, as every freelancer knows, can be a really big obstacle. Um, 
the other part of it, I think the one of the biggest obstacles of being a freelancer is also one of the best parts of being a freelancer. Um, you know, when you when you work for a company, you have a a, an, a desk and you got to be there at a certain time. And there's people making sure that you're going to show up and all these things. There's a lot of checks and balances. And when you become a freelancer, all that goes away. And it was kind of um, a big realization that I made that if like if I don't work, nobody cares. Like there's plenty mm. of digital techs, plenty of photographers in this city. But at the same time, this freedom uh, is the best part of being a freelancer. The fact that nobody is making you do anything allows you to, you know, set your own boundaries in terms of how much work you're going to try and do in a month or mm -hmm. how much time you're going to set aside for personal projects or where you're going to work from or what you're going to do. So how do you balance this time management and how are you able to like find the self-motivation? Cause like, you know, all of us, sometimes we deal with it. Like we have bad days and you know, we may not really want to get up and go to work and do something, but if you have a nine to five, you kind of just have to go. Um, but how do you balance that on days when, you know, it just might not be your day? Yeah, that's a great question. And I had a really good conversation with a friend of mine recently about this. It's like a totally different mindset. You know, when you have a full-time job, you're there, for a certain number of hours a day, there's like a contract that you write up before you start, you're gonna be compensated. And, you know, for the most part, it's like all set in stone. And when you become a freelancer, I think it's really important to recognize that it's not, it's different than a nine to five. If you do eight hours of work in a day, you're not gonna get paid for eight hours. Maybe you'll get, maybe you'll do eight hours of work and get paid for a week's worth of work, or maybe you'll do eight hours of work and get paid nothing at all. But it's, I think it's really important just to be easy on yourself when, you know, maybe something doesn't work out or maybe a job didn't go as well as you had planned and just recognize that it's, uh, it's more about the quality of the work you do as opposed to the quantity. Mm. And you said you've learned a lot, you know, since you've been a freelancer, like these technical skills for photography, which is wonderful. Um, have you found any challenges in the fashion industry as being a small business or being a freelancer? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that getting paid is hard because you're just one person and mm -hmm. Most of the vendors that I work for are large companies, you know, and their accounting departments are dealing with like so much stuff, like paying the people who make the clothing, getting the material, like paying people to get the materials, paying big production companies, paying all their employees, like just mm -hmm. an individual in this huge network can get lost very easily. And, you know, when you're a freelancer, a lot of times it can feel like there's this evil cabal of, you know, companies out there who are trying to get you to work without paying you. And I, I, that may be the case in a very few instances. However, I think it's just a matter of, you know, an individual is easily overlooked. I think that it's not necessarily right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it shouldn't be like this. Uh, and it shouldn't be so difficult for individuals to get paid. There should be more resources for us to take advantage of. Mm -hmm. However, um, you know, it's it's something to keep in mind while you're working as a freelancer. Right. And have you taken advantage of any of the resources that are out there, like the freelancers and free or small claims court? And like, how? What was your experience with that? Yeah. I so I've taken advantage of both. And the first one I took advantage of was the uh, was small claims court, and yeah. I'm kind of weird. Like my, when I was growing up, my mom was always was like really big into civic action, <laughs> like yeah. you know, getting me to vote and like follow local politics and stuff like this. So <laughs> when I first decided I was going to sue someone in small claims court, it was kind of like exciting for me in a way. Like mm -hmm. learning about how the court system worked, reading up on right. the documentation and what I had to prepare. And so like I got all my materials ready and I was like, you know, reading up on strategies and all this. I was like really prepared. And then I got <laughs> there and like the company didn't even show up. Like the other party didn't even show up. 
you know? Wow. So, so I won that case. It was very easy. And I was like actually very happy with how the process played out, even though, you know, it was involved. I had to prepare all the stuff myself. I had to go to the court twice. And, you know, afterwards I had to contact this company and like show this documentation. It was a lot, but it worked out very well in my case. And then more recently, I have tried to take advantage of the Freelance as a Free Act by contacting the, I believe it's the Department of Consumer Affairs. Mm -hmm. This, I'm not so much a fan of Freelance as a Free. And that's not necessarily because it's worse. Mm -hmm. um, it's really nice that people with LLCs can take advantage of it. It's more open to different types of small businesses. However, it does seem to me like the the office that handles it is understaffed and it's it can be difficult to get in contact with people. It can be difficult to hear back. And you know, and it's just kind of a more obscure process, you know. Like when you're when you file a claim and with freelancers and free, then it just kind of like disappears into the ether and you have to mm -hmm. take on their word that they're working for you, you know, like they're working to move this process along, even though there may not be a lot of evidence for that. So, yeah, I appreciate that freelance, the Freelancers and Free Act exists. However, I do think it could be improved. Great, great. Um, and I think this is a good time to bring in Misha into this conversation. Um, uh, Misha, so tell us, you know, when we reached out to you, um, we were talking about, you wanted to talk about financial transparency. So like, you know, I want to talk to you a little about that. And I'll tell us a little bit about financial transparency, like describe it for someone who may not know what that is. Yes, so the fashion industry lacks financial transparency and this is not something you find in any other industry. So what does that mean? It goes across the board, right? So that means that you have bookkeeping that, is you could say opaque uh that is not <laughs> clear transparent um you have late payment or even non-payment uh sometimes you have uh agencies that claim that a client didn't pay when they did pay so this is not a norm that we should accept um this is particularly mm -hmm. true for models and uh due to the this like multi-level structure of hiring in the industry. And this affects as well makeup artists, photographers, stylists, anyone who relies on, you could say a middleman uh, to receive mm -hmm. their payment because we don't, don't contract directly with our clients. You receive a 1099 uh, through your agency and everything goes through your agency. And so those issues uh, can in <laughs> to an abusive nature, right? Um, you could say one instance, you could say is a mistake. Um, but this is uh, a situation where the categorization itself of being a freelancer is not the issue. Um, it's actually the abusive practices. Um, that is the issue. So obviously um, you have other people, and again, I, I think I can relate to, let's say like the actors union where mm -hmm. you do have these individually controlled jobs where you are like you receive a w-2 and you're considered an employee we know that that's not possible in the fashion industry um that's okay but we should not have these abusive practices and so for the past 10 years the mall alliance has actually run um model alliance support line so mm -hmm. ma support um so this is actually a grievance reporting and support line where you know we hear from all types of freelancers, whether they're working or aspiring and they're dealing with late payment and or non-payment and it, the question is like, what do you do? Um, and so we're able to actually connect them with the appropriate resources. And sometimes we're also talking about sexual harassment and assault, um, mm -hmm. any kind of scams or potential trafficking schemes. And so we're able to provide these kind of oftentimes legal referrals um, to mm -hmm. these individuals with our support line. Great. Um, so I kind of want to backtrack a little bit and talk about this like archaic structure that these mm -hmm. companies use to pay people. Like, do you have an idea of like what that looks like on their end in the background? Right, that's a good question because a lot of these brands, if you talk about like big brands, big major brands, they have accounting, they have uh, employees receiving weekly, bi-weekly, even a weekly checks and payments mm -hmm. and salary jobs. So there is actual accounting that is appropriate and proper. However, um, 
oftentimes, yeah, the problem can lie with um, the agency of not invoicing uh, those uh, clients appropriately. Um, sometimes, yes, it is true that the problem does lie with the client. Um, and then there are not uh, ways um, to really acquire that payment. The issue mm -hmm. is there's no transparency. And yeah. so the person who actually has done the work um, doesn't have any way of getting paid if one of those, uh, you could say, bad actors um, mm -hmm. is there. And so that's what's really important is about having this be a system that if there is some kind of abuse that we're able to address that and, and find a solution for it um, and mediate it. So that of course may require a third party system, yeah. um, which is what we've been doing with uh, the creation of like the respect program, which talk about more later, but- um, Yeah, actually, yeah. let's go into that. So I was gonna ask you like what remedies are out there? So uh, let's talk about the that. Yes, um, so I think even before remedies, just kind of thinking also about the structure, reminding everyone of the structures of the financial industry, which for instance, um, you know, fashion is very much uh, female dominated industry in terms of talent, right? Um, so a lot of times women and girls are heavily impacted and the individuals with the power tend to be male and oftentimes they are white male uh, individuals specifically. And so a lot of the disparities we see that exist in our everyday world actually exist even more in the fashion industry. And so this has created, um, this is not obviously the sole reason, uh, we're not definitely not stating that. However, um, we've that fashion industry in its current state is one that is unfortunately um, ripe with abuse in which um, oftentimes individuals who are the most vulnerable um, are put in positions where they can fall victim to all types of abuse, including, including financial discrimination, sexual abuse. So uh, what can we do? <laughs> so right. obviously in terms of the, the financial abuse, for instance, um, what's in the, obviously we did help champion the Freelancers and Free Act, right? And so this bill, um, we worked together with the Freelancers Union to pass in 2017. However, as Brendan said, uh, there are um, huge loopholes um, that leave a lot of us unprotected. And so this is something that we are really, really welcoming the Freelancers Union support to correct. And so the RESPECT program um, is actually, it is a private sector initiative that uses legally binding agreements um, to create a chain of accountability worldwide, right? So unlike mm -hmm. um, maybe other industries, which may be very much segmented and protected and those specific laws of that one country rule that industry, we know that fashion is global, which is mm -hmm. actually a very beautiful thing um, that we all can work in multiple countries. However, we know that the abuse that exists then is also global. And so we need legally binding agreements that can cover that and acknowledge that. And so um, the New York Times, for instance, actually called our program like one of the most ambitious solutions. Um, <laughs> we use, right, we use contract law um, to create enforceable standards and it specifically also of course including um, financial transparency timely payment um, and these proper channels for reporting abuse because that's important right is like we need people to feel safe that they can report abuse and that they know that that will be um, acknowledged without any repercussions against them um, yeah. also what's important is education right I think um, we you know yes think happened um, and we want people to be educated about what to do correctly to know their rights and responsibilities and that goes both ways um, this isn't about calling out specific people it's about changing a system and so we know that it's not just about the individuals it's all of us working together to change and so respect covers not just models but all creatives um, and so obviously yeah you can learn even more on um, our site modelalliance.org but that's the gist of, of what we're doing. <laughs> I really appreciate that. And, um, you know, as we bring Kira and Demi into this conversation, I think we're going to come back a little bit to some of the stuff that you mentioned yes. um, and you can increase the dialogue. So Kira and Demi, um, welcome. Uh, tell us a little bit about the project you're working on. Sure, thank you. Thanks a lot for having us. Um, so what we're doing is we're building um, a platform called Fashion Watch and it should be a comprehensive platform 
detailing the scope of sexual assault and harassment in the fashion industry. And we're doing that through various ways. So we're tracking lawsuits and uh, summarizing confidential surveys, then sharing resources from our nonprofit partners, such as a freelancers union and their fashion workers initiative and other partners that we recently established. And then we're hoping that based on those, uh, you know, surveys, we can also publish some reported investigative stories on our website once we launch the website um, and also partner with news outlets. Uh, outlets. So as I mentioned previously, we were initially funded by the Brown Institute for Media Innovation at Columbia Journalism School, uh, which Bo Kerr and I attended, and that's how we met. So yeah, we've been working on the project for a little bit over a year, and um, you know, it's our baby, and we're not giving up on it, and we're very serious <laughs> about it. And we do know that um, it takes years, and this issue is very, very important for me and also very personal for me from like my previous experience in the fashion industry. Um, yeah, so, you know, right now we're just continuing to build trust and resources and partners. We already have a few, so that's amazing. And um, and we're in it, in it for, for the long ride, so. Great, um, so like what have you seen so far through some of your research? Um, I'll, I'll take this one. Um, we're collecting data in a couple of different ways. Um, so the first thing that we're doing, as Debbie mentioned, is we're tracking lawsuits. And, you know, that's not just going through a database and saying, like, there's this and this and this. There's also we're planning on writing summaries of those for the public based on the information that is public within those lawsuits. Um, just because I don't know if anybody here has read through lawsuits. I personally think it's fun, but I'm not normal. So um, <laughs> There is that, but so the idea is that, you know, the first way is we'll go through legal databases as we have been doing, uh, we'll collect lawsuits using a bunch of different keywords and filters, um, and then we'll kind of be able to track those online and also publish summaries of what's happening for kind of a more general public to understand so that they don't have to read the lawsuits. Um, we've gone through, kind of, we've gone through dozens already, but we know that there are a lot more. We have, you know, entire, entire spreadsheets for the things that we still need to check. So. There's that. Um, the majority of cases are in New York, LA, and Miami, so we are focusing initially on those, but we'll be expanding um, as we as we delve deeper into this. Um, the second way that we're collecting data, as Debbie mentioned, is we have confidential surveys. So one of the things that we've done over the past year is build these surveys, um, both for models and for other fashion workers. Um, and we've done that with uh, other reporters who've worked in on investigative projects that uh, include sexual assault. We've consulted sort of sociologists um, and people who are used to kind of building surveys to make sure that, you know, we're not uh, introducing questions that would bias answers and we're not, you know, writing questions that would exclude people because they maybe haven't categorized their experiences one way or another. Mm -hmm. um, we have been working with data and privacy experts as well to make sure that those surveys remain, you know, fully confidential. <laughs> um, and that, you know, from there we'll be figuring out just how to really work with that data, what it can tell us, um, and ideally also following up with some of the people uh, who speak to us through those. Um, I would also say that, you know, there is a lot of overlap between mm -hmm. our subject areas with the Model Alliance, but I think one of the ways that we're different to that is what we would really like to do as investigative journalists is document um, and, you know, where we have our sources consent make public mm -hmm. uh, instances that we instances allegations that we that we find out about um and you know ideally we're because we're journalists we're not support services referring you know referring people who come to us to places like the mobile alliance who can support them in other ways yeah. misha did you want to say something to this yeah so i just want to say i think that's also a wonderful place that we should collaborate because we actually have published um studies um so collaborated with um, including harvard university for publishing um, studies uh, specifically about some of the topics you're talking about. And so I think this is a wonderful opportunity um, to, to find ways to work together. So that I think that's really exciting. Absolutely. That's really exciting. Absolutely. We have we have talked actually to Sarah as if uh, you're our founder and Sydney, mm -hmm. but uh, we can we can follow up on that with you. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. And Lloyd, I guess I can uh, talk more about the trends that we noticed from our reporting and, and, and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Um, so like I said, I started reporting on this since the beginning of the Me Too movement 
And honestly, when it comes to the fashion industry, nothing has changed. Uh, so there are like large exposés, obviously, about Harvey Weinstein and then, you know, the Epstein sex trafficking stuff, which actually involves love models. And there are traces back to that even now, which is like really crazy and scary. Um, but basically after the Me Too movement started, what started happening, there are certain photographers like Mario Testino and others who are famous fashion photographers who got fired from Vogue and other places. But the thing is, <clears throat> and they have lawsuits filed against them. But the thing is, they're back to work. So nothing has changed. Mm -hmm. Then we have recent cases like with Alexander Wang and, and you know, his alleged abuse um, as one of the most recent news stories. And again, that case was settled. So so once again, it's very, very, very hard to push change. And I'm um, sure Misha and, uh, and Model Alliance knows that because they've been working on it for a decade. So, you know, it's definitely going to take a long time. What we've seen so far, um, although, of course, we're we have been mostly focusing on sexual assault and harassment in the fashion industry. Um, there are many, many other issues that come up um, that we might also report on or at least mention in, in our news stories. Um, and, you know, because we're here talking with the freelancers union, um, a lot of the abuse comes from labor exploit exploitation because models are independent contractors and that makes everything just so much more difficult. So um, they lack legal protections and often give up all of their power once they sign binding agreements and NDAs with modeling agencies. And uh, let me tell you, as Misha knows, I'm sure those agreements are not for the model's benefit and you have to be really careful what you sign. Um, models endure financial and social instability, eating disorders and mental health issues are also very common. And, you know, combine that with sexual harassment and assault, it just becomes um, a fight for your life sometimes. And, you know, like, and mental health issues, like, uh, terrifying, terrifying. Um, so there are some uh, advocacy nonprofits that we are partnering with, including Mall and Lions being like the only one in the world that's doing such amazing work. Um, but there, we haven't really seen much journalistic endeavors that document the scale and the you know impact of those industries' colossal power imbalances. So that's why you know we're doing this work and we're really really passionate about it. Um, what? Sorry to interrupt, but like, why do you think that's the case? Why is it that journalists and the journalism world hasn't really reported on this? Yeah. Well, you know, they report on certain cases, um, like the big news stories, uh, mm -hmm. or after the Me Too movement with the certain photographers, or now with Alexander Wang. Why it's the case? I mean, you know, everything comes down to money, and uh, media industry has been a struggling industry for what the past decade now, especially since mm -hmm. everything became digital. Uh, so, investigative journalism is largely underfunded. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, so this is why we have to be independent. Kara and I, uh, because we wouldn't be able to work on a project of this scale otherwise. And that's why, you know, we have to get grants and, and, and other funding and probably eventually even open a nonprofit newsroom ourselves because there's no other way to like get money to, to do the kind of work that we do. So, yeah. Um, if I can jump in as well on that answer, yeah, so I can direct. Yeah, okay. um, I think one of the other reasons that, you know, there isn't this serious investigative reporting into this topic is a lot of the same reasons that there weren't really big investigations into um, the sorts of allegations that we heard against Harvey Weinstein a couple of years ago. Um, you know, it's not taken that seriously. It's, it's by people outside of the industry, it's seen as glamorous. It's seen as like, well, you're putting yourself out there, so you're kind of asking for it. Um, Mm -hmm. And, you know, at the other side of that is you have these very big, powerful individual figures who people are really scared to talk about. Um, you know, you could find yourself out of work for, for doing so. And that's a really scary prospect, especially in an industry which is so dependent on, you know, your clients saying, yeah, they were great to work with. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I think to uh, jump off of you, Kara, like when you said that, you know, we're trying to make things public, um, just to clarify that a little bit, because a lot of people would get scared thinking that we would like leak something or uh, that's not absolutely the case. Uh, the case is 
We have um, at least a few models that we've spoken to who are high profile models and um, they still have things to lose, but they, they don't fear retaliation as much as younger models. So we would only publish a story with the models or you know anyone else we're talking to consent and a lot of them are mm -hmm. Um, really sick of what's happening in the industry and are speaking out themselves. Uh, but larger portion of our project is really collecting this data that then can be used for like legislation, right? So um, I know Brendan um, on this on this call is part of the Fashion Workers Initiative, and they reached out to us. So uh, you know, one of the main points is that they could use that data as evidence that we collected and then go to, you know, Albany and push for legislation, which is, you know, becomes one of the larger goals for what we're doing. Uh, we can't do that ourselves, but at least we can provide that data for them to move forward with that. Right. Great. Um, <clears throat> so let me bring Tristan into this since we're gradually talking about policy a little bit and then we'll open up the conversation. But Tristan, let's um, tell us a little bit about the policy you've been working on with the Free Dancers Union. Yeah, um, much like I think a lot of us here, um, we've been dealing with you know sort of late or non-payment. Um, really, the problem kind of starts with when you send the invoice, right? Then it kind of gets delivered to this black box accounting department where you don't really know, even if you have a kind of contract in place, you're not really sure when those funds will be dispersed. Um, you know, even if it's, you know, the client has mandated a net 30 payment, which means you'll get the money in 30 days. Does that mean that, okay, we started the transfer then, or is it, well, it's 30 days, but if it doesn't fall on a Friday, then it's 35 days. And then if the weekend happens, then it's 38 days. Right. So there's just a lot of uncertainty with all this kind of stuff. So I just started thinking about this recently and um, started doing some research into uh, the history of you know why net 30 even exists uh, to me it seemed a little bit arbitrary and it turns out it's based on this historical thing called trade credit right uh, which is um, if you know let's say if I have a t-shirt store and Lloyd is selling t-shirts he sells me his stock and then I have 30 days to move those t-shirts to my customers and then pay him back right so it kind of gives this kind of wiggle room so that you can you know I can fulfill my deal with Lloyd, right? Um, you know, and then there's obviously uh, other things that are kind of anachronisms today, such as, you know, banking and the mailing system, right? I mean, today we have JustWorks, we have PayPal, we have Google Pay, we have Apple Pay, we have Venmo, right? There's just a lot of different ways, not only to pay people, but to pay them pretty much instantaneously. Um, so I kind of came up with this aggressive policy of paying freelancers within seven days because we have much more volatile uh, work schedules, honestly, and lifestyles than people who are in staff positions, who you know typically get paid every two weeks. Um, so I kind of you know use that as a starting point and a jumping off point for uh, the policy proposal, and kind of came up with sort of three main things that the policy proposal is trying to achieve. And honestly, if any one of those would uh, become more of a reality it would be a victory, right? But we're kind of shooting for uh, sort of, we're tr I'm trying to kind of get as much as I can with this. And I think it's it's all pretty self, you know, it all kind of makes sense and it's kind of common sense kind of stuff. I'll kind of uh, lay out the main three points. Uh, one is mm -hmm. the mandatory mm -hmm. institution of contracts, but also the enforcement. Um, the Freelances and Free Act already stipulates that contracts must be provided um, but, you know, just in my field personally, uh, professionally, um, I have never received a contract for any work. And in fact, I've had to instate my own kind of standard statement of work, which is a one page kind of, you know, uh, sheet that I send through DocuSign and have the client start uh, sign at the at the instatement of the job that just lays out not only the ways that I can get paid, but the, the rates, uh, the project dates, who the main people are, um, yeah, and of course the payment terms. Um, so that's number one. Um, I, I think we should have the mandatory institution of contracts. And in fact, in my policy proposal, I've listed um, a standard boilerplate contract that's about three pages or so that 
I think is pretty industry agnostic. So even freelancers in other fields, for example, healthcare workers or financial professionals or what have you um, outside of the creative fields could use this contract and uh, just use it as a potential um, uh, uh, conversation point at the very least mm -hmm. with their next employer. Um, so that's number one. Uh, the second would be creating accountability for these contracts through a portal website via the, the Department of Consumer and Worker Protections, which is a department within specifically New York City. Um, this would basically create um, a third party with the department, uh, which would um, basically when a worker and uh, their employer sign on to work together, the sort of boilerplate contract would be on the site and both parties would sign it. And then um, the Department of Worker Protections can kind of triage um, whether uh, the work has been paid for, whether the work has been done satisfactory, right? Um, we can create um, sort of, the idea is to create um, basically um, uh, there could be random sort of assessments that could be instituted or of course the freelancer could say like, hey, you know, it's been seven days and the client hasn't really paid me yet. Um, can we, you know, see what the holdup is, right? Mm -hmm. And then the third is enforcing surcharges for clients who do not comply with this or un otherwise unable to amend their current payment systems. Um, I mean, it, it might sound like I'm kind of talking about a utopia where clients can pay in seven days. The reality is I already have clients that pay me uh, immediately or certainly within seven days. So when you start to realize that, you understand that these are choices that, cl that companies are making, right? There are no guardrails in terms of laws that stipulate that um, you, you have to pay freelancers um, on, a, on a normal schedule, right? Um, it's, yeah. it's the same reason that we don't have 12 year olds working in McDonald's, right? Because there are laws in place to make sure that this doesn't happen, you know? And, you know, I mean, it seems ridiculous, but um, I'm sure McDonald's would be exploring that, right? Or, you know, <laughs> that actor X, right? So, you know, it's, it's really just a simple uh, matter of speaking. And, you know, I, I know it's a, it's a crazy example, right? But for staff employees, uh, it is actually against the law to pay beyond the payment schedule, right? So, mm -hmm. I mean, there are laws in place and that's, that's something that uh, staff employees enjoy. So I guess I'm just trying to get to a level playing field uh, with other workers, really. That's really interesting. Um, and how do you think, or how do you envision getting this enacted um, in the yeah, city? So, um, in the city? Yeah, yeah, so uh, with the Freelancers Union, um, I and I'm on a panel with other freelancers, and we've been uh, vetting uh, <laughs> city council candidates as well as mayoral candidates. So, in addition to um, asking them questions and kind of getting their ear for a host of freelancer issues that matter to us, uh, this being one of them, um, I've kind of uh, put it out there to pretty much all of them, um, kind of laying out the points that I just laid out right now and uh, just kind of getting their insight onto how realistic this is and kind of what difficulties this might uh, sort of uh, face and honestly, any way to strengthen the policy. Um, I consider the policy like a really living, breathing document. Um, I'm very transparent about, you know, anybody who wants to read it can, and I'm not above like editing it and revising it as it, as it develops. Um, and a lot of the city council candidates um, have been really receptive to it. And we've actually got um, one of them at least, um, uh, actually more like two or three that um, have been really receptive to actually having it as part of their platform. and. Uh, putting it on their website even. So this is like something that, you know, what, what I like about this is it's nonpartisan, right? Because Democrat or Republican, we all like to get paid on time. It's completely a nonpartisan issue. You know, it's just, it's just a basic human decency kind of thing. And I think that really speaks to a lot of the city council candidates um, coming out of a pandemic. You know, there's so many, um, you know, rights issues that we're dealing with, right? I mean, I don't even have to mention them. We already, they're mm -hmm. at the front of our minds, right? And so it's just been kind of a really easy sell to most of these people as we vote for them in, in June. 
That's really interesting, and I'm glad you brought that up. Um, so I want to open up the panel now a little more and talk about some of these like labor exploitation. So like Brendan and Misha, direct this question to you, and even Tristan, um, have you ever dealt with an NDA before or clients forcing you to get NDA? Uh, so I think, I mean, COVID is one of the more recent examples I think we can talk about mm -hmm. um, in that, um, sets right off the bat without having actual, you know, vetted safety measures in place. Uh, we're making um, individual models as well as I've heard the, the other talent on set, including makeup artists, photographers, everyone, sign um, sign waivers, um, that which are completely something that you legally should not be able to make people and force people to sign, but say you have to sign this waiver, which completely um, makes us not responsible for anything that happens to you health wise at all on this set um, in order to work. Um, and so that's an instance where hands are tied. We are not legally protected under any by anyone. Um, and so it's either you, you know, disrupt um, your <laughs> financials um, mm -hmm. and not take a job, which obviously in this industry has more repercussions than just monetarily it's your network it's your reputation it's everything um yeah or just you know in you can endanger yourself so that is maybe one of the more recent examples um and i think also just to backtrack to just contracts in general it's 100 the contracts are not fair um they're not ones that anyone in their right mind outside of the fashion industry would sign um, in terms of exclusivity in terms of the the power structure um the lack of control of your own finances, um, the ability to charge uh, potentially exorbitant fees, um, the control over individuals who are um, immigrants and they are under, um, not their legal status is dependent on um, the, on these contracts and in which oftentimes they're being threatened uh, with deportation if they do not do as the agency tells them to do. So it is, it is a, a, a major issue. Um, across the board. And I think also Tristan would love to also connect um, after this panel because there's a lot of synergies with what you're doing and the RESPECT program. And I, honestly, it's, as we can tell, we have to be united to, to create change in this industry. And so would love to, to sit down um, and like work together. So I, it's really wonderful um, what you're doing. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Brenda, did you want to add anything to this? Um, I, well, so I have a specific example of the COVID you know, mm -hmm. the NDAs, uh, we all signed a lot of, or not NDAs, I'm sorry, but, you know, the liability agreements in terms right. of getting sick on so. And they were always kind of fishy to me, but, you know, it was just part of, like, doing the job. It's like, you know, mm -hmm. you just got to sign this paper now before you go on set. And, but then one day I was on set and the producer of the photo shoot, we're all sitting and she's like, oh, I felt so sick this morning. I had a sore throat. And we were like, are you kidding me? Like, are you out of your mind? And you showed up today. And like, after going through all, like, how many things I had to sign, how many, you know, questions I had to answer about whom I've contacted and where I've been, and whether or not I'm sick. And that was a moment of clarity for me. And after that, I stopped working for a while because I, it was just so unacceptable that I would have to sign these, like, very detailed legal agreements, but then the organization that was getting me to sign them wouldn't put the proper, you know, protocol in place to actually take care of this issue. And so, you know, and yeah, I did lose a, a few clients. I mean, I'm very fortunate. I'm so such a lucky person because I was able to stop working and my partner has, is working from home and, you know, I didn't lose my house. I'm still able to feed myself. Like, I'm not concerned about what I'm going to be doing next month. But I know that there are so many people in this city, not just in fashion, in all types of work, and they don't have that type of security, you know? And, yeah, it's it's difficult, but it's really heartening to, to hear from people like yourselves, you know, everybody on this call who are really working hard to make it so that that is not the reality anymore. Great. Um, so I want to ask another question for the entire panel. It was brought up earlier about this power dynamics that we see in the fashion industry, where sometimes it's like the, 
the people making decisions at the very top are executives or white men, and the ones that are working um, doing all the real work are women, people of color, you know, others. But then we've also seen another dynamic where um, people, I think Misha brought this up earlier about people who are immigrants that are abused and all this. So you know, the question, in your opinion, how has power dynamics exacerbated abuse in the industry and how do we tackle that problem? Anybody want to take a shot at it first? <laughs> I guess not. I feel like I should let, I mean, I can totally speak on it, but I think you, if you guys want to um, jump in, we can totally, totally do it. <laughs> I would love to hear what you, what you have to say. Okay. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's, it's complicated, right? Um, a lot of this also is the fact that, and hopefully Lloyd is not gone. I'm sure he'll be back. Okay, there he is. Hi, Lloyd. Go. <laughs> Good to you. Um, oh, these days. <laughs> so it's it's really really complicated because um, I mean, even if you think about also just to you know to make sure the point is stated is that there are also a lot of male victims, male sexual mm -hmm. abuse victims. And we also live in a society where they don't feel comfortable speaking out um, and their right. concerns are not taken seriously. And mm -hmm. so we have um, this dynamic where we have how the people, individuals outside of the fashion industry, their perception, um, like was mentioned of this industry of like, oh, it's glamorous, it's fine. Like you, you should, like, why are you complaining? Um, or you've signed up for this, you should welcome this. Um, and I think it's the same if, across the board. If you're a creative, you're an artist, you're they're like, you're choosing that path of, mm -hmm. of lack of stability. Um, you know, so there is a huge uphill battle that we have to fight against um, so it's kind of that outsourced per perception and educating people and seeing like, no, 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 we are workers. We deserve workers, right? We deserve fair treatment. Um, we are human beings and this is this is good work. Uh, work is good, it's good work. Um, and so a lot of this, um, also speaking on this dynamic, um, it's, we can't just have kind of code of conducts. We can't just have kind of uh, performative activism in terms of um, diversity. We know those don't work. Those don't work mm -hmm. in worlds outside of the fashion industry. So why do we think they're gonna work here? Um, we right. need uh, legally binding agreements. We need them 100%. Um, we need sustainable change and it doesn't just happen overnight. So we have to work together um, and, and fix this problem across the board from, they say, like the garment workers to the models on the campaigns. Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of some of it is education um, and having there be um, legally binding agreements, which ensure that there's education, um, there are enforceable standards, there are repercussions, there are third party uh, reporting system mechanisms where, um, you know, if someone reports that they don't have a repercussion happen and that also that there is something where, uh, so in the respect program, for instance, um, it is that if there is a bad actor, um, brands under the program, they can no longer work with that ad actor in order to remain in good standing in the program, for instance, right? So this misconduct is reported and, and independently investigated. So that deals with that power dynamic. It fixes it. Um, so we need transparency and holding people accountable. Um, and the only way to do that, as we can see, is we can legally binding agreements. So that is my answer to that question. <laughs> Uh, anybody else want to add something to this? Yeah, I can right jump. Um, Misha, I like, totally agree with, with everything that you said. I think there are a few things that we can do and we're already doing. And, and like I've said before, like it's all about collective power. One person or one organization is not going to change the industry. And that's why we're having this discussion today, you know, and that's why we're collaborating. What we've been seeing happening in the industry, um, a lot of models uh, are starting to speak out. However, it's still a little bit of a taboo topic. So people who can afford and have the power to speak out, they should. And, and there are a number of models who are already doing that. Um, 
And then, you know, nonprofits like Model Alliance are super important. And then uh, pushing for legislative work and those um, agreements that Misha, you're talking about. I know one model has mentioned that it'd be super useful to have an agreement on the model side, even if uh, they write it themselves to present it to, let's say, a photographer to explain what their boundaries are. So, for example, when you show off the set, you can be like, hand them an agreement and saying, like, I'm not doing any new shoots or like any other boundaries that you have. Again, for younger models, like, you know, they're probably not going to sign it. They're going to be like, what are you talking about? But I think some um, more high profile models have started to do that and it works, but it, ne it really needs to become like a standard. Everything that we're talking about needs to become a standard. And also education is another thing. So we need to talk about it so that people understand that um, this is the issue. And it's not just like this glamorous, amazing industry to be part in. And that comes with education from our organizations like Model Alliance and also journalism. And that's why, you know, we're doing the work that we're doing because I think that journalism is really important. Um, how it has impacted the fashion industry. Um, I mean, it has impacted everything and everyone, and it has been an open secret for decades. Um, and really, like, there are a lot, there are more questions than answers on how to solve this problem, and like, it's gonna take mm -hmm. 10 years. Um, but for example, there are some models who are speaking out, one being Karen Elson, who's an international supermodel and has been for 25 plus years. Um, and I don't know if you recently saw, but, um, she she spoke with the cut uh, the publication and the article talked about her how she publicly ended all of her agreements with all of her like top modeling agencies to make a statement against abuse in the fashion industry and now she's gonna go and represent herself um and one example that i can't forget that she spoke about in the interview was a few years ago so can you imagine a few years ago she was already really famous, like high profile model. Uh, she was doing a shoot in a pool of water and um, someone decided that it's a good idea to dump a few bottles of bleach in the water. And she was like under the water. So she was saying that her eyes were burning, sk um, skin was on fire. She couldn't see, she hit a wall. She went straight to the emergency room and um, immediately her agent called her saying, oh my God, we need to send flowers to the client. To the client, like, can you imagine? It's because she left the set, because she like, Im like was immersed in like, you know, a wa like water with bleach. So it's just yeah. like, kind of like an example of how ridiculous the industry is and how models are being treated so inhumanely. Just like, it's literally like about basic human rights at the end of the day. Um, Right. Yeah, so there are no easy answers, and we all just have to, you know, to work, to work together um, to cause some change. So is there, you know, for anyone here, is there anything that we think could get accomplished in the short term? Because some of these are like really big projects that's going to take a lot of work and collective power and movement building. But what can what can we do in the short term? What can we, what's the small post goal? So, I mean, honestly, the kind of reforming and passing legislation um, mm -hmm. to ensure that, you know, workers in the fashion industry have these legal pathways to justice um, in the face of, you know, sexual and financial exploitation is completely um, realistic, actually. Um, and so it's, it takes a matter of us as a collective of fashion workers speaking up um, and really advocating and demanding um, this fair treatment. Um, and so I think we've already seen that there are ways to push that that needle. Um, and so just looking at what exists and then looking at how we can um, refor reform those, those uh, pieces of legislation is something that we can do. Um, so I think obviously changing a mindset is difficult. That takes a lot of time, but we actually can do a lot um, from in terms of legal pathways. Brendan, did you want to add to this? Yeah, so I, I, I've been working with Tristan and the rest of the people who work at the Fashion Workers Initiative. And, um, you know, a, a small thing you can do is just talk to your colleagues. Like, um, you know, this discussion about power dynamics, you hear a lot of things about white males. And sometimes I'm like, I'm a white male. You know, I'm not. <laughs> that but it's yeah. true. You know, it's a system and it's a system that was made to benefit me. But if 
you can recognize that and just you know be observant about the things that are happening around you on set and mm -hmm. talk to your colleagues about it and you know get involved in organizations then that can be a it's a big step it's a small thing but it's a big step if more people start doing things like that in the fashion industry appreciate that uh, yeah, um, oh sorry I was going to say, Misha, if you want to talk a little bit about um, the Adult Survivors Act that Model Lions just helped pass. Oh, right. Yeah, <laughs> that was, a, um, yeah, so that was, it was a huge effort um, in order to, to ensure that, you know, a, adults who might have experienced abuse um, in, you know, I think because there's, you can say there's like a statute of limitations um, yeah. to a lot of abuses and this enables that, you know, adult survivors can actually um, seek justice um, for what they're doing. And so a lot of this was us advocating um, to um, the officials um, to one, pay attention to this act and also vote on it and we actually successfully be able to, to push it through. Um, so it's been actually incredibly exciting uh, change. Um, and so obviously this does affect a lot of the times because in the fashion industry, uh, oftentimes models are, they start out in the industry underage. And so if they have experienced abuse, um, by the time they are an adult, um, a lot of times, right, that it, how can they seek justice? So this is one, one avenue, um, for that. Um, but yeah, feel free to speak more on it. <laughs> uh, no, I just think it was an amazing effort and it really speaks to you know um what lloyd asked about short term where we can do short term like that's already done like that's amazing in 2019 they passed the uh children's survivors act um and now yeah. it's adult survivors act and it's literally amazing and you know only only um <laughs> we'll take it from there uh to see whatever legislations we can um can enact right if I can jump in and then I'll pass back to Tristan. Yeah. I just, I, one of the things that I, I think we're talking about two real things here. One is, you know, uh, creating standards via policy and legislation. And those, that's kind of chipping it away at this thing that seems giant and, you know, something that would be really difficult to get past otherwise, but those do make a big difference. And the second is the thing that Brendan spoke about, which is really another form of data collection and data sharing. You're getting, you're, you know, you're sharing information that you're receiving with other people. Um, or you know, sharing things that you're seeing and you're making sure that there's a strong network there. Um, and I think Tristan, you were gonna say something that fed off that? Yeah, uh, kind of. Um, I was just gonna say too, like, uh, you know, something that we can do right now. I mean, we have an election coming up. Um, it's not as sexy as the presidential one, right? But it's actually mm -hmm. an election in New York that um, we have much more of a voice in just because way, way less people vote in these mayoral and city council candidates. Um, and I would bet that many people uh, on this, you know, listening to this right now, might not even know who their city council candidates are. I mean, I definitely didn't. So I was right there too, until we started doing the whole vetting process. So get educated on the candidates, you know, and, and you know, find out which ones are the ones that like align with your values. And if you don't live in New York, um, you know, these ideas are something that you can take to wherever you are. You know, there's nothing stopping you from starting your own group, um, writing your own policies or legislations or, you know, getting in touch with all of us and just kind of staying involved that way. Great. Um, so I would like to thank all the panelists here for coming in tonight. Um, this was a great discussion, lively discussion. I think there's a lot of synergy here. Um, and you see there's a lot of crossover, too. Um, and it seems like we're all working on different things that all together, I think, will make such a huge impact in the fashion industry. So I want to thank everyone that was here to attend and all those that are watching. And um, we hope to hear from you again. Um, thank you so much. <laughs>